Well, welcome to another episode of Big Ideas in App Architecture. I am super excited today to welcome Andy Pavlo as a guest um, on the show. Andy, as you and I have talked, I wanted to make sure I properly introduce you with your proper title. But then you threw me for a loop with like this very long thing that I, I was like too embarrassed or afraid to, to, uh, to restate. So I've asked you to introduce yourself properly. Sure. Um, and then we can and then we can jump right into all the fun stuff. I got to be very clear. I, I, it's not like I go to bars and I introduce myself with these titles. This is just if, if, if someone has to put a name tag up, this is what it says. So I fully I, understand. OK, so uh, my name is Andy Pavlo and I am an associate professor with indefinite tenure of databaseology in the computer science department at Carnegie Mellon University. And we are thrilled to have yes. you on the show today. And thank you for, for, uh, for explaining that title. So, so welcome. You and I kind of got to know each other, maybe informally. Um, I, it's, it's a couple of years ago now um, when I was asked to poke around um, a, a benchmarking framework that, that you had something to do with. Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought maybe we'd start there, but maybe even before we get into kind of uh, database benchmarking and OLTP bench and, and the like, you know, do tell us maybe just a little bit about, about you, how you got to, to Carnegie Mellon, you know, what your background is, because there's some, some really interesting things, obviously, that you've, you've been doing, been researching, been looking at. And then obviously, we want to spend a lot of time talking about your newest venture, which is OtterTune. So yes. before we get into all that stuff, maybe just spend a few minutes and tell us a little bit how we got, how you got to where you are. Yeah. So, I mean, what is databaseology? Uh, I mean, first of all, it's not a real term to be very clear here. Uh, and as I said, when they put name tags up, they put that on because the university thinks it's like ecology or neurology, right? But it's, it's made up. But my area of research is, is focused on database systems. Um, and you know, so that means I'm interested in how do you design and, 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 and optimize a, a systems, a software systems to efficiently store, retain, and, and uh, process queries for data. Um, and so prior to being at Carnegie Mellon, this is actually my 10th year, uh, I completed my, my PhD at Brown University under Stan Zavonik and Mike Stonebreaker. And the Stonebreaker name should, should resonate with, with your audience because he's the, he's the inventor of Postgres, Ingress, the Turing Award winner in 2014. Um, and so when I was at, uh, when I was a grad student, I worked on this system called HStore that was commercialized as, as VoltDB. Um, and, you know, when, when I was trying to, you know, when, when I was graduating, finished my PhD, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I know what I didn't want to do, uh, you know, you know, work at like a you know, big bank or something like that. Um, and so I applied to a bunch of uh, startups, uh, you know, research labs, universities. I did not think Carnegie Mellon was, would hire me. So I was very relaxed when I came here and interviewed. Uh, and they wanted someone that does databases and I've been here ever since. And I love it here. Um, yeah. And so then the, you know, it, this leads into why, why do we build OT bench? Or how, how did I meet you? Um, when I was in grad school, we, you know, I wrote, t I wrote four different variations of TPCC, but like the standard OT benchmark that since 1992, that everyone uses to, to measure these systems. And so when I was sort of thinking about going to, you know, academia and what did I want to do next? I realized that if I have students, I don't want them to have to write TPCC four times. So we thought, let's let's write it once in a single framework, have a bunch of other workloads that we can reuse, and just you know have everyone take advantage of these things. Yeah, it's 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 been uh, it's it's been a fantastic tool, and and so you know just a little bit of kind of context on how I I, I stumbled upon it. You know, working at CockroachDB, you know, people come to us all the time and say you know, geez, how does your performance stack up against, you know, some other database? And, and database benchmarking is one way people kind of ascertain whether or not your product is better or worse than some other thing. And what we have found, uh, and that's why we we're so happy to stumble upon the work that you have done, is that, uh, you know, the benchmarking frameworks that were kind of widely available, you know, were in various states of, I think, maturity, various states of, you know, supporting one kind of database or another. And some were just more accessible than others. I mean, I was a Java guy and, and have spent a lot of time writing Java. I could kind of understand and reason about how you'd put together old TP bench. You know, we looked at some of the other things that were popular at the time, and it's like, I don't, this is written in Tickle or, or Lua yes. or some other thing. And I'm like, I don't, I can't, I don't know what this is. So we, 
I ended up kind of spending quite a bit of time in there and, and trying to make it work with cockroach and, and kind of the rest is history. But it's, um, you know, to this day, we, we get it. We, it comes up all the time. Like, Hey, you know, how, how do you guys, or how can we test, um, you know, the database against some other thing and, 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 you know, what, what has now become bench base is kind of, is kind of what we, what we talk to folks about. But before we go down that path a little bit more, I want to, I want to ask you another question just because yes. I, I don't know why I was, I was back in my hometown this, this past week, I was born in Orlando and we were down there for the Gartner analytics summit and just had me reflecting on like childhood a little bit. And I, you know, when I graduated college, I wanted to, I didn't know what I wanted to do either, I suppose, but I ended up dual majoring in, I think, MIS and finance. And, yes. and it's funny you say big bank. I, I realized very quickly, I didn't want to go work for a bank either. Yes. So I stayed and did MIS. How, how did you end up, you know, even like kind of getting into databases as a field? I mean, what, what was like the, you know, the thing that, that got you down this path to begin with? I'm just so curious about kind of how folks end up kind of yeah. in the industries they chose. Do, do you remember what, what kind of drove you down, down this path? Absolutely. Yes. So <clears throat> it was, I knew I do. So, so, you know, in undergrad, I think a reoccurring theme that I experienced uh, was that for whatever reason, I understood databases better than, than everyone else. Um, my first interaction with, with like my SQL, this is going back to like 1999, like my SQL three um, was I used, I used to work for a, a I don't want to go too much details. It was a sketchy startup where the, 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 my boss was a crook and it was kind of doing, he was doing like shady stuff and the his sort of business partners fired him. And then they were like, okay, well, you, you know, it was doing web programming stuff. Like start mm -hmm. working on this new project. And I had to learn what my sequel was. So this is like, I was in high school. Um, and for me, it just clicked and like relational database had made sense. And throughout like my undergraduate career. And then when I went off to like a sort of pre-doc uh, at the University of Wisconsin, like the reoccurring theme that I noticed was like, for whatever reason, I seem to understand what databases were doing much more easily than other people. And I'm not saying that like, I'm super, you know, I'm smarter than everyone else. I'm a coach. It's just like, I realized this was sort of my thing. Um, and then when it came, came time to go to grad school, I had the fortunate opportunity to hook up with, uh, with, you know, with Stan, Stan and, and, and Stonebreaker start building this database system from scratch. And then the same thing, it was just like, I learned a lot as I went along and I realized that like, I incredibly, I, I'm, I enjoy this, it's fun. My databases are awesome uh, because they're in everything. And yeah, it was just one of the things that like, I just noticed, I just picked up maybe in my early twenties that this is something that like, I'm just better at than everyone else. So I just keep going and see how, see, see how far I can go with this. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny you say that. I, I've kind of found a similar thing, I, I think. They, it, they rule the world. I mean, they run the yes. world. Like there's so very little that's out there that, you know, some, you know, some way, shape or form, you can't trace, um, you know, the lineage of what's happening, you know, back to something being stored in a database. And um, so I, I, I tell my students that like, you know, you think of the two classes of software that's like super important. Uh, there, there's several categories, but like operating systems, of course, uh, web browsers, everyone's using and databases. And, you know, at the university, we don't really teach a course on how to build a web browser. We teach a course how to build a database system. Right? It's that, like that important. I can't really think of any other sort of class of applications above, uh, above the operating system where you have a whole like dedicated course on how to build a specific software type. Um, cause they like said, it's, it's, it's in everything. They're not going away. It just, you know, they're, they're, they're the backbone of every, every major application. Yeah, I, I totally agree. So, you know, going back to kind of this, this idea of OLTP bench. So you wrote, you wrote a paper, I mean, and please do correct me because yes. I'm kind of, I'm going to buy some of this from memory, but you, you wrote this paper. Um, I can't remember the full name of it, but where you described kind of this, you know, this, this approach to benchmarking databases. And, and in that paper, you described not only TPCC, which I think many people would know about, but there were a handful of other kind of, you know, well-known or, or, or proposed benchmarks for doing this. Um, which, which again was, was super fascinating for me in, in my reading, just because again, you know, working for a database company, people are always like, and you know, how do I test? Um, you know, what do I do? I mean, can you talk just a little bit about kind of some of the, some of the thinking or thoughts behind kind of creating that? And, and then, you know, would love to maybe just talk a little bit about kind of how bench bait or excuse me, OLTP bench kind of has 
you know, how, how it's been kind of constructed, how it evolved over the years, and then mm -hmm. kind of where it is today. And then I think that's a nice segue into to OtterTune, which I'm, I, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing yes. about. I mean, to, all to be benched, and I'm sure you, you guys will provide the GitHub link uh, in the description. Like, it, that actually was the precursor to AutoTunes. So we, we, that's a natural segue. Um, so the original O2B Bench project was a collaboration between myself, um, Carlo Carino, who was a postdoc at MIT, who's now at Microsoft, and then uh, Philippe Crusadou Manol, which uh, he's Swiss. I'm, I'm butchering it, but like um, in University of Freiburg, and his student Jalel. So they had a the the MIT guys had this other project, Relational Cloud, and they had a Java-based benchmarking framework. Hmm. And then when I was working at HDOR, I had a sort of my own Java-based benchmarking framework. Um, and we, we realized, okay, we basically have the same thing. Other people implement the same thing. Let's implement this once and for all and, and you know, see how far we can push it. The, the reason why there's, we had so many workloads beyond just TPCC is because in academia, it's very hard to get access to real workloads um, to, you know, to run experiments. And, and if you're building a system, you know, it's a research project. You don't have customers. You don't have things to try. You can try things out on other than, than, uh, than synthetic workloads. So that was sort of the, 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 the additional side of OT benches. In addition to building a single framework, we actually then try to find other workloads mm -hmm. uh, that we could then port into to OT bench. So for example, there's, we have a workload based on what we think of as the access patterns in Twitter. Um, we actually took the Wikipedia uh, source code, the MediaWiki PHP source code, converted their transactions into Java, and then, and that, and then there's a benchmark for that. Um, so obviously the, the data is all synthetic, but it's uh, it's based on actually analyzing some real workload traces and understanding what they actually do. Um, so that was that was the original motivation of like, okay, it's it's hard to get real workloads in academia. Let's just have a suite that can kind of do it has a bunch of them that we can use for all our different projects. Yeah, and it, and and I think that's so important because um, you know it, it really started as this way that it was kind of like this extensible way, just as you described, to like add additional workloads to simulate new kinds of things. Because you know certainly in our work, and it, you know somebody may describe what they're currently doing today in a database, and it may you know we have to kind of do this pattern matching between what they what their workload looks like, what their schema looks like, what their workload looks like you know, versus mm -hmm. something else and having like lots of different options because not every workload looks like TPCC, right? Or looks yep. like, uh, what is it, YCSB, yes. which is another certainly well-known one. So I think one of the really neat things that drew us initially to, to OLTP Bench was that there was these different flavors. So we could say, you know what, I, okay, I get it. What you're trying to do is, is, is more like this thing than this other thing and let's let it rip. And then the other thing is there's tons of customization you could do, right? So, you, you know, this ideal parallelism, I'm going to, you know, launch any number of these threads. I want to generate this amount of work. So we could really, you could really get in there and kind of fine tune it to, to be at least as close as possible to, to represent some, some workload to give people a sense of, of what, and, and of course you supported multiple databases, which, which again was nice. And you happen to support Postgres, which was kind of a, yes, a close cousin of, of cockroach. We, we also got some in the early days. We got some patches from like new ADB sent us patches for spread the yeah. data system. Uh, Cockroach did a lot of work as well. We'll talk about that later. But like we had some vendors actually send patches for their databases as well. The only challenge with that one is we can't actually some of them we can't test if they're cloud, you know, the cloud platforms or the proprietary. Yeah. Um, so uh, you know, I think we've gotten better at making sure we 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 test and and and, and make sure that things aren't, aren't broken for other different databases. Um, but as the goal, the idea is like a single framework is putting different workloads for different databases. So you can start doing true apples to apples comparisons, uh, which is hard to do. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's super, uh, super hard to do and, and remind, and I may have this wrong, but I think like over the years, you've had your students kind of participate in, in kind of working on adding to resolving. Isn't that correct? I mean, it's been kind of like, yes. So, yeah. So over the years, uh, I've had sort of new students get started, uh, like, you know, I'm not saying I'm vetting them or like as like a like a job interview, but like you know, a new, new student comes to me and says, "I want to work on databases." So before we start throwing them on like the you know, the bigger project that's more more complicated, we give them something smaller, maybe in, in, in bench base or P bench, and see how they see how they see how they do with it. Um, and so since since the very beginning, part of the reason we changed the name from OTP bench to bench base is we started adding analytical workloads like TPCH, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. something like TPCDS. We're working on that, but like we've added new students, add new workloads over the years. So, so even though it's a ten year pro, ten year old project at this point, 
uh, we, we are still trying to keep things up to date and add in new workloads as, as we need, as they come along. Yeah, it's great. And then, and then I mean, I, my recollection of this might be different than than reality, but I, I, you know, at one point I kind of based on the direction of my boss at the time who wanted me to go and see if I could get uh, OLTP Bench to work with Cockroach, I forked it. Yes. And then I have this like bad habit of just like doing all these things at once. Yes. And so I like, <laughs> I made all these crazy changes. And I think I, I realized, I, you know, kind of not terribly long after I did that, that like, there's no way. And now I've like already now like this, you know, this, the train has left the station. There's no way these guys are ever going to want any of my stuff back in, yes. back into, uh, into, uh, to OLTB bench. And then like, I, I randomly got this email one day this is, I feel like this was a long time after I'd kind of gone down this path that yes. is either you or one of the students reached out. I was like, Hey, you know, we're trying to merge this stuff. I'm like, really? Oh, okay. I'd love to help. That's awesome. You um, did a hard fork. So we, I think student value. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I forget what they were searching for, because uh, it's not like you showed up in the GitHub fork list. Uh, and and like these changes are amazing. We want all these things. Let's see if we can do it. You know, get you to help us put it back in. Yeah. So that was fun. We we worked for a while to get kind of kind of get everything uh, back in there. But it, it it's been fantastic. I have so enjoyed, and I you know I appreciate you all um, kind of taking a look at the at the work that I did because I've so enjoyed you know yes. kind of learning a lot not only about databases about benchmarking. You know, how to write kind of code like this do it effectively we actually learned a ton uh, about cockroach i think in the process because just as as you described you know the ability to run these multiple workloads that have different flavors you know different query patterns different requirements for indexing different types of schema you know doing that in a kind of an efficient way has been it's been kind of a really a neat process for us and i would say um, also too, uh, recently uh carlo carino's team at microsoft they've been helping out contributing uh, you know, not just making work better on SQL Server, but also, you know, fixing other bugs and issues like that. So they, they've sort of stepped up in the last year or so and been contributing back to the project as well. It's good to see like Carlo and his team come, you know, 10 years later, come back around and still work. Yeah. Around. Yeah. And I, as I've said to you over Slack and other places, I've been a very bad helper recently by, no, 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 <laughs> it's, by getting, getting distracted yeah. and other things. But, you know, so for, for Cockroach, the, the interesting thing has been, you know, we, we're running all these workloads and we're finding things that we can internally do better. It's been a really good way for, for us to identify potential, potential optimizations within our code uh, as a database product. And, and it's, um, it's been a great way. And we've had a number of, of, of prospects and customers start their journey with Cockroach using Benchbase. Uh, but I think that's kind of a nice segue into kind of what you've been doing on um, kind of on the side, which is this, this startup that you've created called OtterTune. And I did not realize you guys had been at it for as long as you have. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, you know, and the more I, I learn and read about it, the more excited I am about what, what y'all are trying to do. So maybe, maybe we kind of use that as a, a jumping off point into you know, what is OtterTune? And, and before you, because look, you know, we're named after a database or a, yes. a cockroach. We have this funny name. So now I have like this interest in naming. I'd love yes. to know why or how you came up with this name. But then, yeah, tell us all about what you've been doing with Autotune. Yeah, so uh, so there, and there is a connection with Benchbase with Autotune. I'll discuss in a second. The name Autotune is just a play on the words of Autotune. Uh, so my, my PG student, Dana Van Aken, she went to, I think, some zoo, liked otters, got a t-shirt <laughs> of an otter. Uh, and then she's like, oh, we should call this Autotune. I'm like, oh, okay, brilliant. Let's do it. Um, I think the name there only was, there's like some acapella group at some university that is also oh, called the Otter funny. Tunes. Uh, but that, that was their own sort of only competition for this. Um, so it's just a play on Otter Tunes. Okay. I thought, you know, like cockroaches, they'll survive anything. I thought maybe like otters, there was some like, uh, there's something about the animal that was indicative so, of high performance or something. Uh, we did not realize this until later that like Otter Tunes, or sorry, not Otter, otters, the animal are vicious animals. Um, really? Oh yeah, like go Google. There's like okay. look on YouTube. Otter type otter fights X or like whatever. Pick another animal, and they're Cockroaches. they'll fight. They're, 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 like like they all look all cute and cuddly, but they're vicious. Uh, that's um, funny. I didn't know that. We, I heard that about pandas, by the way. Or is it, I pandas imagine. or koala bears? I think are like cuddly, but yeah, no, no. Koalas cockers. are they're like they're like brain dead because the eucalyptus doesn't give them enough energy. So like, oh really? Yeah. I've, well, <laughs> I've seen them. So I think there was a Davis conference in Australia at some point. I went down and they, there's some petting zoo where you can touch koalas and they barely, they smell terrible and they barely move because like the eucalyptus doesn't give enough nutrients. I um, have no idea. 
So uh, let me tell, uh, I'll describe what otter tuning is in a second. I'm going to tell one quick story about how vicious otters are. So we were going to, sp- for like, you know, marketing reasons, we were going to sponsor an otter at the Pittsburgh Zoo, the local zoo. Because uh, w- one of our investors is the founder of Duolingo. Uh, and they they sponsored a an owl, you know, after their mascot at the the, the National Avery here in, in the city. So we're like, okay, let's sponsor an otter. That can't cost that much. So when we called the zoo to do it, uh, she, you know, the woman's like, oh, yeah, you know, let me go check with the trainers and so forth. But then she's like, just so you know, you can't go in into the, 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 the enclosure with them, right? And she's like, they're so vicious that they, even like the, the handlers don't even want to go in there. Like, because they'll fight and kill anything. Um, so it, but we didn't know this before. Like, we were like, oh, otters are cute. And then, then like, apparently they're like, they're like murderers. Um, <laughs> All right, so have you, is, have you have you thought of changing the name at all, or is this now? It's just like we're embracing the violence of this my, mascot. I think that uh, as long as we're careful in what we say. Uh, again, this, this is your podcast. I don't want to get you fired, but like, just again, just lean Google into auto- it. Yeah, what's that? You just lean into it. You'll just lean into the name. Well, yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, so, as I said, so AutoTune, the, the name is a play on AutoTune, and the idea of of AutoTune, the main sort of the big picture we're trying to do is apply machine learning techniques to optimize database systems. And the original research project uh, at, the, at the university was on doing knob configuration tuning. So these are these runtime parameters that control the behavior of the system. Every database system has them, even though they're, they're a huge pain. Um, they, they're basically like buffer pool sizes, caching policies, log file sizes, things you can tune uh, as the end user of how to, for how the data system is going to be used by the application. And the reason why these knobs exist is because when the developer is actually building the database system, at some point they have to make a decision about how much memory to allocate for a hash table. And then instead of putting a pound to find in the source code or some hard-coded value, they expose it as a knob because they assume someone else who knows more about databases or knows more about the applications come along and, and tune it, but it never happens. Um, and so you just accumulate these knobs over time. So now... The new version of Autotune that we're, work, that we're releasing, it's, by the time this podcast comes out, it'll be out. But the, the new version that we're putting out this year expands and goes beyond knob tuning. We're doing index tuning. We're doing query tuning. We'll talk about why that, that matters as well. But that, the original research project of Autotune was just doing knob tuning. And, and ha- so how this relates actually to Benchbase or OTB Bench was the the... One of the things that we, we we were building out when I started building it at when I started at CMU in OT Bench was the ability to collect the runtime metrics of 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 the, from the database system, like the, the internal telemetry that every system generates, pages read, pages written, locks held, and so forth. And then it would then upload it, the bench or OT Bench would then upload it automatically to a website to keep track of these things. Um, and I was we we were heavily inspired by the the code speed project from PyPy, like thinking like continuous integration, keeping mm-hmm. track of like performance of things over time. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I because what I really wanted was I wanted to be able to run experiments and then store it all in a single re, you know repository, click one button to make me the graph that I could put in my research papers. That's that was what I really really wanted. <laughs> um, and then from there I sort of realized, oh well, okay, if you have this, all this telemetry, what what can you start do, to do with it? Um, and my my PhD thesis was on using ML-like techniques uh, before ML was a, a big thing, but basically optimization, automated techniques to, to optimize H-Store or MultiB databases. But as I said, the big challenge I was facing was that it was impossible to get real workloads from customers. And so we were relying on synthetic, uh, these synthetic workloads in, in LPBench. So the idea then with, with the original version of Autotune was, well, what can I do or what can I optimize in a database system automatically Using you know using a machine learning or, or automation technique that does not require the database does not actually look at need to look at the queries, um, and so the idea was that by like, these runtime telemetry that is a stand-in or represent representation of what the workload actually is without actually having to see the workload, mm-hmm. and so we were trying to use that as the signal to decide how to optimize the system. Also, too, at the time there hadn't not there hadn't been a lot of work on doing automated knob tuning. There's some, maybe some work done in the mid 2000s, but it wasn't like the long history of, of research projects like like an index tuning or query tuning. Yeah. Um, so then w- through the through the OTPM bench project, that website then morphed into like the first version of AutoTune, where we just we just used you know simple machine learning techniques to to tune basic knobs. 
and then we sort of got it got more sophisticated over, as over time went as time went yeah, I remember. Then, I remember ahead, making yes. some of my changes. I remember what the hell is uploading. What is this like IP address? Where is this going? I think one yes. of the first changes I made is like I'm ripping this out. I yes. don't know what this is doing here. This isn't gonna. You know, I can't use this. But uh, now it makes sense what y'all are doing. And um, and so basically, what happened was while uh, well, we we published the first paper about Ottertune in Sigmod, which is the yeah. top conference in, in databases. Sure. And yeah, the the other academics were like, oh, this seems kind of cool. This seems kind of nice. But nobody in industry like paid attention to it. And then we met the guy that runs all of Amazon's machine learning uh, uh, division or group, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and he came to Carnegie Mellon. I got huh. five minutes of time just to thank him for giving Dana, my PhD student, you know, a couple thousand dollars to run her experiments EC2. And he was like, great, can you write a blog article for us? We just started the new Amazon AI blog. We need material. So we just converted the Sigma paper into a blog article wow. that, that got published on, in, in, on Amazon site. And then that's when everyone started emailing us and saying, we have the exact problem. We'll yeah. give you money to fly a student out, set up Autotune for us. Um, yeah. And this happened so many times. Like, okay, clearly there's a, there's a signal here. We, we should go do a startup. Well, you know, it, it's funny. I, I think it's such an interesting thing because, um, you know, again, and, and I, I'm, you know, kind of more of a, a blue collar approach to this, but obviously, you know, in the applications I've been building and teams I've run, and even at Cockroach when we're working on evaluations for folks, you know, people are always trying to squeeze as much out of the database as they can. And I think most people, you know, and, and we do this today too. We start at the schema. Is the schema right? Is, you know, is, is, you know, what's, what are your queries look like? Are those properly tuned? Do we have indexes? But, you know, I know Cockroach does this and I know many databases I've ever worked with have hundreds of these, of these knobs, as you call them, the tune, you know, changing this parameter. And, and, you know, you're out there searching and it's like, oh, somebody said do this, somebody said do that. And you end up with this like list of like five or 10, 15, 20 things I'm going to adjust, but it's like, I have no idea where this is working. You know, you run something, it's like, well, it didn't break. Yeah. So, you know, maybe somewhere it's going to be better. Um, so I, I, I find this fascinating. I mean, how did y'all, how do y'all determine like what knobs to even touch and how do you set expectations about whether or not this is even going to, you know, is even a relevant or, or related change to whatever I'm trying to do. I, that to me was like one of the biggest questions I had as I was reading through. It's like, how do you know what to, what, to what would make sense? So, yeah. So, so the first step, you, as you said, you got to figure out what knobs to actually tune. Let's mm -hmm. be honest. So the, I think there's about 500 knobs in MySQL, Jeez. 400 knobs in Postgres, but not all of them, you know, not all of them things you actually would want to tune automatically. Like they're the directory names, file names, yeah. port numbers. Like if you tune those, the system doesn't work. So we obviously <laughs> put those in a deny list. We really um, like this port over here. Why don't you try this? Yes. Uh, and so, um, so then the, the next step is you, you, you do have to do some manual curation to find knobs or particular values for knobs that mm -hmm. could affect, uh, the safety of the database. Cause you know, the most obvious thing is like, if you turn off disk writes or, or you know, F calling F sync to flush the yeah. logged disk, when you commit a transaction, the machine learning algorithms find out really quickly if not writing things to disk makes your database goes faster. But if you now crash, you lose, you know, lose less. 10 seconds of the, of the log, you lose all your data. Uh, th there's an external cost that the machine learning models or algorithms can't reason about. So a human has to come in and say, okay, well, we don't turn off S-Sync because th that's an external cost the algorithms can't, 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 even, can't reason about. So then the next step is you, we basically did a uh, sort of a random walk, if you will, of just trying out different, different knobs for, in different workloads, different situations, just to collect the training data and then you do a uh, you run a ranking algorithm to figure out which knobs you think have the most impact mm -hmm. on on performance, um, and it actually it actually works reasonably well. Like to no surprise, uh, if, you're, if you're on Postgres, it's InnoDB buffer pool size. If you're, if it's sorry, that, that's in, that's MySQL. Postgres is shared buffer size. Like the buffer pool is almost always the the or mm -hmm. is always the, the biggest thing. If you're reading writing from disk, your your performance is terrible. So. We basically looked at look at the list. It seemed reasonable. The, after like ten, it's hard to say whether it actually one makes better that one is different than another. Um, in some situations, actually, depending on the workload too, some not the ranking might might differ, uh, but usually not for like the top eight or top ten. They're, they're almost always the same. Um, so you so you, so that gives you the, the knobs you think you should target first. And there are the original version Ottertune would sort of do a incremental approach of like 
maybe tuning five knobs, let it go for a little while, and then tune eight, then tune 10, and mm -hmm. sort of expand it. Because you the, the knobs that have the most impact will give you, give you the most benefit right away. Um, there are other methods in, in the academic literature that try to try all at once um, hmm. using deep nets and or reinforcement learning, right? So there's, there's, you know, there's improved techniques for, you know, maybe looking at a wider, wider number of knobs uh, than the original version of Autotune did. Um, and then your next question is, okay, how do you determine like what you think is gonna make the difference or tell, tell the user, or what do you, what do you want to know? Like, like you want to know, like, how does the algorithm figure out this is the knobs I should tune? And the, yeah. I mean, I, I think, yeah, not only that, but then, you know, this kind of, I would imagine I do something right. And I could, it could have a negative impact for some reason. Right. Sure. I mean, you know, yes. and so like, how, how is the system then kind of making sure that I'm making like forward progress continually? Yeah. Yeah, it's so kind of an this, interesting thing. So this would be a good difference between the academic version and the commercial version. Hmm. So in the academic version, we made the assumption that people would not tune production databases with something like Autotune because it's machine learning. The models have to learn. So that means that hmm. there may be times where it tries out things that make, make performance gets worse. Um, and then we also assumed that because you're running, you're not running production, that you're running on a clone that you would have you would have a workload trace that you, you can repeatedly run over and over again to see whether you're making things better until the models converge you think you have the best recommendation and then you can then apply it to the production database and again when we were at the university everybody we talked to uh could do this uh like we talked to you know was a, we did a deployment at a, at a major bank in france they had they had a whole team that could set up things on, on clones uh we talked to the patent office uh we talked to you know other pretty big companies that could do this since we commercialized it, we've realized that not everyone can do this. Uh, you know, m most people cannot capture a workload trace. Like, get, here's all the SQL queries executed, and then run that on the side. And then most people also just, you know, not know how to don't want to set up another clone or a machine because that, that's expensive to run to run experiments for auto tune to tune. So in the in the commercial version, we're actually tuning the production database uh, directly. And so that means that we have to be more cautious in mm. the recommendations we make and mm -hmm. be a bit more, uh, sort of set up more guardrails to make mm -hmm. sure that it doesn't, things don't go wrong. Um, and so that just means that like, it, it'll be less aggressive in exploring the, the solution space. And that you know, we, we try to use some, you know, the, some training data we've collected from previous databases to help make sure like the first things we try out for your database is not like way out of line, way out of whack. Now, um... Yeah, I'm always surprised when I go and visit prospects or customers, and maybe not even so much now, even, you know, just in previous work about, you know, just, you know, quite honestly, people's existing knowledge of, of databases or whatever technology it is, you know, you, I think sometimes you assume that people who, you know, have have been in a company for many years and working on a product have like this deep knowledge. Well, it, you know, yes. it's not true necessarily. There's, there's folks out there that are doing important things and maybe don't understand all the details. Yes. You know, I'm curious, like, you know, to the extent that you can share, like, is there like, Hey, you know, there, we walked into one place and we, you know, we were able to do this like amazing work. Uh, you know, in other words, is there an outlier there where, where Ottertune came in and just blew somebody's doors off because, you know, their, their existing setup was, was so potentially problematic. I'm just kind of curious what the, the average. So, yeah, I, I think that I, this, this doesn't sound like I'm, I'm bragging. Uh, and it, so I don't want to come off, come off that way, but, um, or being pretentious, but like we, we have found that the, the, for knob tuning, the algorithms work better in the real world than they did in the university because we, we, as a baseline, when we did our experiments for research projects, we assumed that people maybe have, have done a bit more tuning than we actually than, than they actually do. Uh, they, 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 we assume that the user would be a bit more sophisticated than, than we, we are finding. Um, mm -hmm. Now, it, I think in both cases, though, for there's people that have done almost no tuning or actually zero tuning. Uh, we've had customers tell us, you know, since we're targeting Postgres MySQL and running on Amazon. People have told us that they thought Amazon had already tuned their database for them. Yeah, uh, yeah. And they're not. Jeff Bezos is not doing anything in your database, right? Um, but even places where they had in-house DBAs that have tuned the database, we can still, uh, the auto tune algorithms can still like carve off another 20, 25% improvement. Um, wow. Because it's just hard. There's so many different things you have to deal with. And the, you know, even if you have a full-time DBA, if you have a lot of databases, which, which you would have if you need to, if you're going to 
pay for VBA. They're doing so many other things that they don't really have time to tune every single database for exactly. Uh, uh, look, I mean, I, you know, as somebody who works with databases every day, you know, and, and represents a database company, you know, our own documentation and our own list of knobs is incredible. It is. It's, it's, yes. it's daunting to understand and, and, and fully appreciate what, you know, each and every change does. So do, that doesn't surprise me because it's, you know, it's hard enough to do all the other stuff, right. You know, to yes. get into these kind of like esoteric, you know, settings is, is a whole other ball of wax. Yeah. Yes. Um, you had said though, that, you know, you started with knobs, but you all are moving into, you know, index tuning, query tuning and the like, what, what's that look like? Because I'm curious. And the reason I'm asking is I'm curious, like, as you've gotten into that, you know, where's the biggest bang for the buck? Is it, is it schema and index tuning? Is it query plans? Is it, is it all of this stuff? Have you even measured that? What's, what's, what are you doing? We and haven't what are measured your thoughts it, on that? But it, it, so we haven't measured it, but it, it varies, right? Mm. So, uh, you know, for some applications, the, the knob tuning is like, they, they have all the right indexes. The query plans could use some work, but the knob, to, like the biggest win they can get right away is for knob tuning, yeah. right? In other cases, if you don't have the right indexes and all your queries are sequential scans, uh, or you're just doing nested, terrible nested loop joins, then like we can tune the knobs all day, but like yeah. we can't magically make your query run faster because it doesn't have the index. Uh, so I would say it varies. Um, but even then, everybody everybody needs everything. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> no, there's no, we have not come across any database like, oh my God, like here's your money back. You don't need us, right? Every, there's always something. And the reason is because databases aren't static in that like, you know, they're, they're, they're ingesting new data, but also upstream the application is never static. Uh, the only place we've ever come across where like someone has told us like, yeah, we, our application hasn't changed in three years was the patent office, rightfully so, like what, what changes? Uh, but everybody else is like, you know, like any other company, you're putting out new features based on what customers want and so forth. And so new features mean new, new queries, new complexity and yeah. new data for the database. And so in that case, people struggle with understanding how, as their application evolves, the, 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 you know, so the configuration, the tuning you know, setup for the database evolves over time as well. There's other things too, where like it's, people may know how to do certain things, but like it just, it, it just falls through the cracks or yeah. people forget to do it. Yeah, um, we see that all the time. So one example would be, uh, we had somebody where uh, they had backups turned off on their production database, right? And the reason because, is because that database used to be the staging database. Uh, and then they, cause they were, they were going from MySQL 5, 7 to 8 or something like that. And then mm. so when they upgraded to 8, made the staging base the production base, someone forgot to turn on backups, right? So like, so it's things like that. I, it's really just hard to, to know what are some of the best practices of, for databases. Because again, they're not usually, these, most of these companies don't have DBAs. It's developers. It's people who are like writing application code. And it's somebody who who maybe set up the database at the last job, they're responsible for setting up the database at this job, but they're doing a bunch of other stuff. And so they just, there's just too many things going on. Yeah, and it's so always what, somebody else's responsibility, you know, and yeah, yes. I mean, we see that a lot. I mean, I've always seen that. It's interesting. And so the the new version of AutoTune that we're, pu we're putting out now is, I mean, at its core, it's still trying to optimize performance, efficiency of the data through knob tuning, indexes, mm -hmm. query tuning, and so forth. But there's, the way we're sort of pitching it at is that it's a, it, we're selling peace of mind. And I realize it's a fuzzy term to say about your database. Uh, and, and especially also coming from, you know, as, as a scientist, like it, it seems like a marketing thing, but like, and it's hard to actually quantify what does it mean to be a peace of mind of your database. But like, this is the thing that people tell us is that like, they just don't know what they don't know about their database and they don't know what they should be doing. And so the new version of AutoTune does all the things I said before, but it's also checking to make sure your database is set up, set up correctly, like the backup backups example. And, and so the, you know, as your, your, your application evolves over time, AutoTune is there with you seeing how it evolves and, and making suggestions uh, along the way. So I don't think, a, you know, the original version of AutoTune, at least the academic project was like, okay, you tune once and then you're done, but it's yeah. really this long-term life cycle of the databases. So really what people need help with. And that, no, that's I, where, where, where we're going. You know, we, again, something we see play out over and over and over again, you know, because databases, once the people understand a particular technology, they tend to use it for everything, whether they should yes. or shouldn't. And so, you know, we've seen certainly many instances where, you know, database design and, and um, oh, like sized 
you know, provisioned for a certain task or workload, all of a sudden is accepting work from some other thing and it's just no yes. longer suited for that. So yeah, that makes total sense to me. This ability to kind of go in and constantly reevaluate whether or not, you know, things are set up correctly based on, based on a new workloads makes a ton of sense. Mm -hmm. I'm curious just on that, because again, this is a topic that comes up for us a little bit is this idea of multi-tenancy. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that, you know, if that makes sense or, or how you think about that and this idea. And it's this, again, this idea that maybe a single database instance is used to serve multiple workloads, maybe, you know, different applications out of different schemas. If, do you guys run into that? Do you have challenges with that? I'd imagine that'd be kind of a, a tricky thing. Or are you just saying, hey, look, that's not exactly how we would advise you to set things up anyway, which is a totally fair response, by the way. So we, the current version of Autotune doesn't really, we can't see like, we see the database, like the, the, the metadata about what mm -hmm. it is, but we don't see like, uh, we're not differentiating between like, you know, which, which yeah, of the yeah. databases are being taxed the that most. That makes sense. Um, the thing that we're working on now is sort of looking at, at the fleet of databases holistically. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I mean by that is like, not just like, just tune, you know, the, not just tuning like this one instance, let me get the best performance of that one thing, but it's really understanding how that instance interacts and is related to other databases in the fleet. Now, some things are obvious, like you have the, the you know, the replication setup, you know what the primary is or the reader writer, you, you know that the Amazon sees that relationship. But oftentimes we see where there's implicit relationships and there are some optimizations or recommendations you can make if you understand how databases are related to each other. So an example, classic example would be like staging and production. So Amazon doesn't know this is the staging base or the production database, but because we actually can see the schemas of the database, we can identify, oh, they're actually the same. And therefore, if we see a schema migration happen on the staging database, we, we can learn, okay, it's going to get applied to the production database in one week, two weeks. You can ask the user when they're going to apply it. And you can start making recommendations for like, Okay, you're gonna add a column that's expensive. Do it for your database. Do it at this time. You won't interfere with things. Or you're renaming a column that's cheap. Do it at this time, right? So you can start making those kind of recommendations, understanding how uh, if you understand how these things are related, like at sort of a logical application level. Another example would be we had a customer where they had a they deployed their application in two different locations. So it was two different front end applications, two different database instances. One in the U.S., one in the EU. Same schema, same workload, same application code, just different physical instances. Amazon doesn't know that they're related because they're not, they're not replicating to each other. But then what happened was they found that the, the, the query latency on the EU database was 10x slower than the US one. It's because they, they forgot to add an index that they added the US one. They, they didn't add it to the EU one. So the new version of Autotune can, can identify, okay, these schemas are the same and yeah prompt the user and say, hey, look, you added this index, you really should be adding yeah. it over here too, because we think they're the same, yes or no, right? So that's, again, is that, so, you know, a lot of that exit is not machine learning, because it's just like identifying yeah. that these things are related. So that's, yeah. that's, but it, it matters a lot. And this is sort of the new version of Autotune is trying to put Well, it's, it's kind of like you say, though, it's peace of mind, right? You know, you're yes. running a complex system, you're doing, you're doing tough stuff. And this is hard, it's hard to be you know, it's hard to be an expert at everything. And so, you yes. know, having that kind of idea that, that somebody can be out there auto otter tuning, this is kind mm -hmm. of, is pretty neat. I, I know we're kind of running up toward the end of uh, the time we have allotted. I wanted to just ask you though, you know, we've been talking a lot about the technology, but, you know, obviously starting a business, starting a, a startup company, uh, it can't be for the faint of heart. Um, yes. I, I know I've, I've been, you know, privileged to watch from the inside as we've been trying to build Cockroach. Just curious on your 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 kind of take on on trying to build this thing and, and getting investors and getting customers. What's that journey been like for you? If you want to share, you certainly don't have to, but I'm just yes, curious, I, more less technical and more like business, what's this been like? Yeah, so I I, I mean, definitely scratching a niche. Uh, you know, many academics do startups. Um, I was very fortunate that my fellow co-founders of my, my former students that I've worked with before on, on Autotunes had, Dana Van Aken is the CTO. She did her PhD with me at, at Carnegie Mellon. And then Bohan Zhang is also a co-founder and he did his master's degree mm -hmm. uh, at CMU. And like he, he worked on the first version of Autotune. Um, so it, that was kind of fortunate that like I, I could go into you know, the company, get it started with, with you know, people that I work for and I trust. And, I, and, I, you know, and you know, they're smarter than I am. They just don't know it. Um, and then when we raised money, uh, we raised money at the beginning of the pandemic. 
uh, which is sort of choppy waters. But uh, we used the funds that we got in the very beginning to go hire my best former students, um, hmm. which, again, I'm very fortunate that, that they came along with, with me. and They've been, they've been fantastic. Um, so that part's been good, but like I got to work with the students that I liked with at mm -hmm. the university. They're, they're with me at the, at the company. Um, I mean, there's, there's ebbs and flows, of course, there's, there's lows and highs. Uh, the, I think the one thing I would say coming from academia, the thing that I underappreciated was the importance of, of like marketing sales and operations. Um, yeah. just like, it's, it's one of the things you don't know what you don't know. Um, so now that we have people that are helping us with these things, I'm like, okay, now I see it. Like, okay, these people, you know, our operations manager is fantastic. She does a bunch of stuff for me and it's, it has been a huge lifesaver. So that part is like, if I knew that sooner, I would have hired people like that uh, earlier. I think that would be the, the one thing I, I've learned the most. Um, and I would think that I, I've enjoyed it because like I'm seeing more databases, more things, more real use cases than I would have just, just building stuff in, in, in the university. And in some cases, there's been problems that have come up uh, with customers that AutoTune's not really going to solve, in a position of solving this. But then there's things like, oh, this is a hard problem, and this is then guide my, my own research back in the university. So one example would be, would be proxies, like PG Bouncer, um, uh, yeah. Odyssey from Yandex. I, I, I don't think that people can even realize how widely deployed these things are. Everywhere. They're everywhere. everywhere. And nobody does any research on them. And they're actually not very good. They're not very high performance. I mean, the Yandex one is pretty good, but like, so that's been, I have a you know, PG student working on proxy stuff now because I saw them a lot in AutoTune. It's not a problem AutoTune can solve. So we've been looking at this So now. can so, I give so, you just a, a little bit of an anecdote there? Um, yes. We see PG Bouncer everywhere. Yes. And it frustrates us because the documentation isn't great and nobody yes. really understands how to tune it. But it sits in the middle of every single connection to the database. And so yes. if that thing goes sideways or is suboptimal, it can yes. look like the database is not doing its job and that may not be the case. So that that's really interesting because it is a it is pervasive in Postgres, yes. obviously. Yes. Um, and it is not well understood. It's not well understood here. Um and, and and again, in part, just because it's 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 very, the whole thing seems very opaque, like the the documentation, the everything. So that's that's really fascinating. We've come across people that run like two or three layers of PG Bouncer. Really, like Jeez. PG Bouncer talks to PG Bouncer, then talks to PG Bouncer. It doesn't surprise me. Postgres. It's insane. Yeah, it's everywhere. So, yeah. So I think, um, like I said, it's it's been. I mean, doing a startup plus I'm now teaching again full time at the university. I'm back. I did, did a one year leave of absence. Uh, and and then plus having a three year old daughter uh, has just been uh, I, I don't know how long I keep doing this but it's, it's but I enjoy it. All right. Well, first of all, I know this is mostly audio only, but for those on video, I, I'll probably get shot if I don't ask what is behind you there. There's at least in oh. my view there is a there's a mannequin. Um, I feel like I feel like you owe it to the people who may be on video to explain what that is. Yeah. So uh, that actually uh, so that's a little Billy. Um, that's actually uh, the child mannequin I had. I got when I was in grad school. Uh, it's how I proposed to my wife uh, for marriage. Um, we can go to that story if you want. Uh, but then when I came to Carnegie Mellon, she's like, you can't bring that child mannequin anywhere until you get tenure because uh, it creeps people out. So then, uh, so I got tenure last year and then I'm like, all right. I taught, I taught, I taught since I taught Cindy or vectorized instructions in my Davis class. So we had to, we had to use the mannequin for, uh, as uh, a pop. That's so awesome. Well, we'll definitely do the, um, the proposal story on, uh, on part two of our conversation. Yes. Um, so I've been ending a lot of the podcasts like this. Um, and cause I know we're wrapping our run out of time, you know, for us, it's like the beginning of a new fiscal year. It's spring. It's like this, I don't know, this time of optimism. You know, I'm just curious, like, what are you looking forward to this year? I mean, you, you, you've got a lot going on. You've got a, a, a daughter, you've got this, you know, this, this startup, you've got things at the university. What's kind of, what's exciting. What are you looking forward to this, this coming year? Um, yeah. So I think I'm actually, so, I, you know, I was very COVID cautious and, I, and I'm actually starting to travel more and, mm. and go visit places and give talks. Um, so that, that I'm looking forward to like seeing all my, my database friends, uh, you know, at, at universities and other other places that in ways that I haven't done in recent years. Um, 
My daughter can't, can, she can't program yet. Uh, if you ask her what her favorite programming language is, she says SQL. So that so far so good there. Uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm looking to sort of see how uh, you know, well done how she grows. Um, uh, and then I, my wife is fantastic, so I, I want to spend more time with her as much as possible. You know, it's hard with a three year old. Um, on the database side, um, I think it's actually, I think I think the the with the economy looking kind of dicey. I, I'm interested in seeing what the sort of the startup landscape looks like for database companies. Um, and I realize you're at a database startup, although mm -hmm. you guys have been around for a while, but mm -hmm. I think it's going to, I think it's going to shake out a lot of uh, sort of the, the weaker companies and sort of, I'm interested to see what that looks like at the end, end, end of this year. Um, I don't think there's any sort of exciting hardware on, on the horizon that I, that like Intel is putting out or NVIDIA is putting out that like, We'll have to change how we think we, we build data systems. Um, like there's nothing really, I, I, as far as I know, that's going like, to change anything. And then the, the large language models and ChatGPT stuff, I think that's super fascinating. We tr we've tried using it to tune databases. Uh, it, it actually get, it doesn't always work because uh, it doesn't know it, what your database is actually doing. Like if you asked it for certain things, like it, it just regurgitates on the Stack Overflow, which isn't always correct. But I think. Um, I'm really interested in seeing where, where that sort of goes next in, in the context of databases. Yeah, we ran into a, a company at Gartner this week that was using it as an interface to query databases, which was yes. really fascinating. Yes. So. I, well, at some point, I want I, I, to at some point, I, I want to start building something new. Uh, I don't know what's going to be yet. I'm. I don't, have, I don't have any free time, but I was like, I might do generative art for, for databases. Like you upload your schema and it makes a pretty picture or something like that, like using, uh, using you know, mid journey or, or Dolly. We'll see. Well, I, I kind of, what I'm going to do after this, I'm going to, cause I did this for, for something at our, our recent sales kickoff. I want to see what Dolly or one of these things says for uh, an otter fighting a cockroach. <laughs> yes. See, see what kind of savagery yes. is revealed there. Yes. Um, well, listen, uh, I, I've always enjoyed our chats and, and certainly enjoyed the, the work that you've done and the projects that you've started. And, and, and I think what y'all are doing at Autotune is, is incredibly fascinating. So I appreciate you joining and telling us a little bit about that. And if you are willing, I'd love to have you on again sometime in the future and we can talk about even more interesting things. Absolutely. I, I, I talk about data. Is, I can do this all day. It's, yeah. it's, I really appreciate you having me. Yeah, it's been great. So thanks again, Andy. We'll talk soon. Thanks again for listening to this week's episode. If you're a fan of the show, be sure to subscribe to the podcast to get every new episode in your feed as they're available. Also rate us five stars on your favorite podcast platform. If you like what you heard, you can also watch Big Ideas and App Architecture on our YouTube page linked in the description. Thanks again. Bye.